Welcome to Wellness Wednesdays. Hope you're having a wonderful day and enjoying this wonderful heat we're having here in Arizona. Here's a little bit of information about um, our University of Arizona Health Sciences, talking about all the different colleges that we have on both of our campuses. Here's some great pictures of our beautiful campuses. We have our main campus in Tucson and our biomedical campus up in Phoenix. Dr. Dake is our leader. He is the University of Arizona Senior Vice President for Health Sciences. And here are all of the links for you to join us um, on all of our social media channels. You can always follow me on A Medina Wildcat. I'd love to have you as a follower. And please, whenever you post anything, please use the hashtag Wellness Wednesdays AZ. So I'm Anne Marie Medina. I am the Director of Corporate and Community Relations for the University of Arizona Health Sciences here in Tucson. I'd also like to introduce you to Caroline Berger, who is our director up at our Phoenix campus, and Allison O2, who serves as our executive director. We'd love to hear from you, so please drop us an email, tag us in your uh, Twitter, and let us know how, how we're doing here for you. Today, we're going to be having a presentation from our speaker who will speak for about 20 minutes, and then she'll have about 10 minutes at the end for your questions. So make sure you leave those questions in the chat box. Just click that box at the bottom of your screen, type in your question, and I'll be sure and ask those questions to our presenter at the end. As always, don't forget, we will have a session evaluation coming out to you in that follow-up email, along with all the links and resources that will be presented today. Make sure you take some time, answer those few questions for us, give us your feedback, so we can make sure and adjust as we go along in our presentations. We'll also email you the link to the recording and the link to all of the past recordings so you can watch ones that you missed or wanna watch again. So let me introduce our speaker today. Laura Morehouse is the Community Outreach Coordinator for the Arizona Poison and Drug Information Center. She has served in her current role since 2016, where she provides community education and outreach on poison prevention, medication management, bites and stings, safety, and more. Laura received her Master of Public Health degree from the University of Arizona with an emphasis in health behavior, health promotion, and is a certified health education specialist. So I'm very excited to hear from Laura today. Welcome, Laura. Thank you. And let me get my screen shared. And then, okay. Hello, everyone. As stated, my name is Laura Morehouse, and I am with the Arizona Poison and Drug Information Center, located at the University of Arizona College of Pharmacy. Today we will be discussing venomous creatures of the Southwest with a particular emphasis on rattlesnakes, scorpions, and Gila monsters. Bites and safe, uh, sting safety is a very important topic this time of year, especially since we have seen seven new rattlesnake bite cases since Sunday. So right now we are in the thick of it. I'll be talking about the common bites and stings in Arizona, including the, effect that, the effects of those bites and the severity. And then we'll talk about some prevention strategies. You can see one of our rattlesnakes right there in that video. That is one of the rattlesnakes we have rotating at our center. A little bit about the Poison Center. We are 24 seven operation, completely free to call. All calls are kept confidential. We are one of two Poison Centers located in Arizona and we serve every county except for Maricopa. We receive about 30,000 calls every year. About 60% of those are actual poisoning cases and then the remaining 40% are information calls. On staff, we have specially trained pharmacists, physicians, genetic counselors, and health educators. So we're here if you ever need us. The number is 1-800-222-1222. So to start off, I'm going to throw out just a couple little statistics. But in the past three years, from 2017 to 2019, the top five bites and stings that we see are scorpions, rattlesnakes, bees, wasps, and hornets, black widows, and centipedes and millipedes. Please note that millipedes are not actually venomous or poisonous, but they are lumped into the centipede category. Now, while scorpions and rattlesnakes are the majority of the exposures we see at the poison center, bees, wasps, and hornets are responsible for the most deaths due to poisoning um, from a bite or sting. And that's why it's bolded there as number three. Now we're going to start with rattlesnakes. They're the most popular creature we talk about and the ones that are perhaps the most feared and least understood. 
Despite their bad reputation, rattlesnakes are very shy, secretive, and play an important role in a healthy ecosystem. So we're going to try to address some of the myths about rattlesnakes, and then we'll try to tell you how to prevent bites this year. To start off, there are about 15 different species of rattlesnakes in Arizona. This one in the video is a black-tailed rattlesnake, commonly found at higher elevations. If you went to Mount Lemmon in Tucson, you might actually see one of these rattlesnakes. They're a very beautiful green color. In 2019, we had 179 bites. We average about 150 to 200 bites per year in our service area. So this is excluding Maricopa County at the time. Nationwide, we see less than 5,000 bites from venomous snakes per year. And you can see we only had 1,091 1 bites from rattlesnakes in 2018 across the nation. This is one of the reasons why the anti-venom is so expensive because rattlesnake bites are still considered to be a rare disease in the United States. So far this year, we have seen 118 bites um, from rattlesnakes in 2020. Again, seven of those were in the past week. The Western Diamondback is the most common of the rattlesnakes we see here in Arizona, and it's also the largest. They typically average around four to six feet in length. I'm going to play a video here that shows a rattlesnake rattling, but first, what are the three characteristics of a rattlesnake? They do have a triangular head, they have elliptical or cat eye pupils, and of course, the signature rattle. There is great diversity in colors, patterns, and size between rattlesnakes. The rattlesnake you'll see in this video is actually a western diamondback, but it's considered to be a pink phase, so that is why it looks pinker in color. So this video is a slow motion shot of the western diamondback rattlesnake rattling, and I'll talk about the rattle in a second. So you can see how fast that rattle goes, especially when it's in slow motion. Now the actual rattle of a rattlesnake is made of keratin, like our fingernails, and is composed of interlocking segments that knock against each other. These segments are hollow, which creates that signature sound of the rattlesnake. Now rattlesnakes do gain a new segment each time they shed, but they can shed three to five times per year. A very common question I get is, can you tell the age of a rattlesnake by how long the rattle is? And the answer is no. Again, since they shed three to five times a year, there's no way to guess how old they are. This next section, we're going to talk about some of the rattlesnake bite trends that we see here in Arizona. And the first one is actually bites by age. Now in the past, rattlesnake bite victims were typically younger in their 20s or early 30s, and they were known to be handling the snake at the time they were bitten. Today, we are actually seeing the age of bite victims increasing. So in 2019, 33% of rattlesnake bite victims were 60 years of age or older. And we are seeing this as an actual trend that continues. Of the seven bites that we received this past week, all of them were over the age of 60. So it's no longer those young white males who are playing with the snakes. We're just starting to see more bite victims be over the age of 40 and over the age of 60 and doing daily activities of living. Now bites by month. Rattlesnakes are usually active between March and October. The peak season for rattlesnake bites is typically August through September as you'll see in this line graph. Last year, we saw two spikes in bites, one in April and the other in August. As the temperatures stay hotter longer, we may see the rattlesnake season expand even from February to November. It's not very common to see rattlesnake bites in December or January, but in the past couple of years, we have had one bite per uh, month there. So far in 2020, we have seen 26 bites so far in August. Um, so in this graph from 2019, August had 35 bites, so we are on track to actually hit the same record as last year. And then the question I get probably the most is, what was happening when the victim was bitten? Were they handling the snake? What were they doing? An analysis of rattlesnake bite cases reported to our poison center between 2015 and 2019, the majority of patients were bitten while walking outside their house. So you can see in the graph, 40% of those patients were walking outside. Now that could be walking outside their house, it could be walking in the desert, it could be walking without any sort of protective footwear. You will see that most rattlesnake bites are unintentional, um, so the second highest percentage is yard work, and they involve daily activities of living, like gardening, like taking out the trash. A lot of people report just stepping outside of their house and a rattlesnake was there curled underneath their porch. And then when you look at playing outside and outdoor recreation, they do account for a smaller percentage of those bites. And then handling the snake 
is 14% right behind yard work and walking outside. So we do still have a problem of people picking up snakes or approaching snakes when they shouldn't. And we're gonna talk more about how to prevent that. First, let's talk a little bit about rattlesnake behavior. Rattlesnakes, again, very shy and secretive. They are very low to the ground, very small, and they know that humans are not there as prey. So camouflage is their first line of defense. They're going to hide, they're going to make themselves as small as possible so that they don't feel threatened. You can see in the video there, this is some of the defensive posturing you might see from a rattlesnake if it's approached and feels like it cannot safely escape. Now rattlesnakes, especially in the summer, will typically hide in shrubs or beneath bushes, behind or beneath rocks, and in debris piles. The defensive posture is a coiling with a rearing of the head the rattlesnake might rattle, but it is actually not required. So rattlesnakes can actually strike without rattling at all. And this does happen to a good percentage of our rattlesnake bite victims. Rattlesnakes like the same temperature as humans. So in the summer, like right now, they'll be most active in the very early morning and then late at night when the temperatures are cooler. Rattlesnakes become less active during the cold weather, but they do not technically hibernate. So if the conditions are nice or it's after a rainy period, they may move around a bit. You might even see them sunning themselves on the asphalt. Here's one example of a rattlesnake sort of camouflaging in the desert. Again, the patterns of their scales really fit into the desert ecosystem very well. So you might not spot the rattlesnake. If you're out hiking on the beautiful trails in Tucson or in Phoenix, you probably pass by at least 10 to 20 rattlesnakes without knowing it. This next video is going to show what it looks like when a Mojave rattlesnake strikes a foot. So I'm going to play it and then we'll talk about the striking of a rattlesnake. And then slow motion. All right, so in that video, again, a Mojave rattlesnake striking a foot. Rattlesnakes can strike up to about half of their body length. So if you do see a rattlesnake, you can take a couple big steps backwards and that will actually take you out of their strike range. But again, rattlesnakes do not want to strike out. They want to camouflage and hide themselves as much as possible. That's why it's so important to just leave snakes alone if you see them in the wild. Rattlesnakes are some of the fastest striking snakes in the world. Um, the first reaction to a rattlesnake bite that we hear from our patients is usually disbelief and then realization that they've been bitten. Um, I'll play that one more time so you can see the slow motion of the video. A lot of people may not know they've been bitten by a rattlesnake until a couple seconds or minutes afterwards. All right. So what happens when a rattlesnake bites you? They inject the venom through their fangs, which are sort of like hyperderm hypodermic needles. So what is made of the venom? We consider it to be a toxic soup made up of many different proteins and peptides, some of which still have not been identified. Typically, rattlesnake venom is made up of different toxic components. The three major categories are cytotoxins, which affect our cells, hemotoxins, which affect the blood, and neurotoxins, which affect our nervous systems. There is a big variability in composition based on species, diet, season, and more. Now, rattlesnakes could have just one of these toxins in their venom, or they could have all three. The Western diamondback is known to have the hemotoxin, so we expect to see more bleeding problems from patients that were banned by a Western diamondback. In comparison, the Mojave rattlesnake is known to have the neurotoxic effects in their venom. And so we expect to see more neurotoxic breathing problems with Mojave rattlesnake bites, and they're typically more severe than other rattlesnakes. So what are the bite symptoms? Typically, people can have any mixture of local injury, coagulopathy, which are bleeding problems, and then systemic effects or neurotoxicity. Now I'm going to show some pictures of rattlesnake bites. So if you're very squeamish, you might want to look away at this point, but there's nothing too bad. Um, so when we see local injury, this is an example of what we see on the left and the right. So a lot of swelling and a lot of bruising. Now you may notice that there are Sharpie marks all around the feet. This is to track the swelling, which is an indicator for how much antivenom a patient will need. Um, so if you do get bitten by a rattlesnake, it doesn't hurt if you have a Sharpie to circle the bite and then to track the swelling. Usually they're going to track it about every half hour to an hour how far the swelling has spread. And again, that's an indication for antivenom. Now coagulopathy is mostly internal, but I had to include a picture of there of a, a blood blister. Now what happens with rattlesnake venom is that actually 
impairs the ability of your body to form clots, which elevates your bleeding risk. Now that bleeding can be delayed in some patients. So it might be an hour, a day even, after the rattlesnake has been bitten, or it could occur again after discharge from the hospital. That's what the recurrent coagulopathy is. So some patients may actually need to be treated more than once with antivenom. This is why when we see patients, we make sure that all the labs are being collected and then that labs after discharge are also collected just in case that coagulopathy happens again. And then lastly, neurotoxicity. Again, there's no one symptom I can tell you is going to happen. Each rattlesnake bite is very individual, but people might experience low blood pressure, muscle twitching, a metallic taste on the tongue, nausea and vomiting, and respiratory depression in some patients. So rattlesnake bites have a wide variety of symptoms and every bite is unique. So we never really know what we're going to get. What is the first they do nots? These are the longer list than the do's. Um, you might have seen snake bite kits in the past. There are some examples on that picture there. They usually include some instrument to suck or to cut um, so you could get the venom out of the body. We no longer recommend any of those. The best snake bite kit, car keys, and a cell phone. So what should you not do? No suction and no cutting. Those have been found to be ineffective and cutting can introduce the risk of infection. No ice and no tourniquets. We actually want to dilute the venom throughout the body, so we don't want it to be concentrated in one area. Concentrating the venom in one area with a tourniquet can actually increase your risk for amputation. No electricity. We have heard these before. These are all things we've seen in cases. There is a common belief that electricity will neutralize the rattlesnake venom in the body. This is not true. Do not apply any sort of electricity. Alcohol and drugs we tend to recommend against unless the specialist has told you to go ahead. And that's because alcohol and certain drugs can actually thin your blood. And so we don't want that to happen when your blood is being affected by the venom. And do not wait and see. You might not feel the effects immediately, but time is tissue. And so the quicker we can get you to treatment, the better your outcome is going to be. So if you're bitten by a rattlesnake, what should you do? You should go to the hospital immediately. Don't delay transportation for first aid. There's actually nothing that can be done in the field to significantly alter the outcome of a serious snake bite. So get to the hospital as quickly as possible. If that's calling 911, go ahead. If you have a friend that might be faster to get you to the hospital, go with them. You do want to remain calm and reassure. Um, if you're out hiking, don't sprint back down the trail, but walk quickly to a safe distance where you can call for help. And while you're doing this, remove any restrictive clothing or jewelry because again, one of the first symptoms is swelling typically. Now anti-venom, the only treatment for rattlesnake bite can't repair damage that has already done. It works to neutralize the venom in the system. So time is tissue, don't delay treatment, get to a hospital as quickly as possible. You'll see the anti-venom or one of them in that picture above. We have two types here in Arizona. We have Crofab and Anavip. Um, it just depends on what hospital you go to, what they have in stock. The nice thing about both of those anti venoms is they work for all species of rattlesnake. That means you do not need to catch the snake or get a picture of the snake in order to be treated. It'll work for all the different species we have here in Arizona. So how can you prevent bites? Be aware of your surroundings. Watch where you put your hands and feet. Make sure you wear the appropriate clothing when you're going to be outside, especially shoes. Know your peak activity times, again, during the summer, early morning and late night. Do not remove rattlesnakes by yourself and do not handle dead snakes because they do have a reflex strike that can work even hours after death. Almost all rattlesnake bites occur when putting unprotected hands or feet where you can't see or don't look or intentionally bothering the snake. So again, leave wildlife alone if possible. And then we're quickly gonna go through scorpions and Gila monsters, a lot less information here because they're not as popular, but we'll go through them very quickly. We do have 30 plus species of um, scorpions in Arizona, but the only one that's considered to be dangerous to humans is the bark scorpion. We had a little over 1,000 stings in 2019. Uh, most stings reported to poison centers occur at night during the warm summer months. This year, we have seen over 940 stings reported so far. The bark scorpion is the smallest of the scorpion species. All scorpions do fluoresce under UV light, so a fun activity to do at night is go out with a black light and find the scorpions in your backyard. The bark scorpion is more dangerous because their venom is neurotoxic. All other scorpions have venom and it can sting you, but it doesn't have the neurotoxic effects. Bark scorpions are known to be climbers, so they are often found on walls or other areas outside. And they're very, very small. They measure less than two inches. 
In the house, scorpions may be seen trapped in sinks and bathtubs or hiding in dark areas of the closet. They can also be found, especially for bark scorpions, climbing walls or clinging to the ceiling. That's because scorpions are attracted to cool, moist areas and air flows. And up there is just a comparison of the giant hairy scorpion on the left to the bark scorpions on the right. You'll notice the bark scorpion is very tiny and has very slender pincers and tail. So the general reaction to a scorpion sting, pain, numbness, and burning or stinging. Now the majority of scorpion stings can be managed at home. Numbness and tingling are frequently reported and may travel across the body. The injured area could also be sensitive to touch, pressure, heat, or cold. Scorpions can also cause systemic reactions, which are a little more serious. Um, they go beyond the local skin reaction. And small children are at the highest risk of severe reactions. So children under the age of five, typically we want to see a little bit closer. What does a systemic reaction look like? Um, children typically have roving eye movements, also known as opsoclonus, jerky body movements, muscle twitching, drooling, and difficulty breathing. If you see any of those symptoms in a child, get help immediately. That is immediate hospital care. I'm just going to quickly show you what the roving eye movements look like in this video. So this is one child that was in a hospital that we saw, and you can just see the eyes rove back and forth. So that's what it looks like, especially if you have young children around. What is treatment for a scorpion sting? At home care can just be a cool compress and then a pain reliever for help. Typically symptoms peak within a couple days and then will disappear over the course of a week. If someone goes to the hospital, it's usually for supportive care, so opioids and airway management for those severe reactions. There is antivenom, it's called Anascorp, and typically patients that receive it need about three to five vials. And that picture there, bark scorpion on the left and a striped-tailed scorpion on the right. There are some scorpion lookalikes. Um, these are harmless to humans, but they inspire fear as well because they seem similar to scorpions. So this picture is a vinegaroon, also known as a whip scorpion, and then a sun spider, also known as a wind scorpion. So again, these are lookalikes and they're harmless. How do you prevent stings? Check your clothes and shoes before putting them on and always check your bed. We recommend shaking out the sheets before you go to bed at night. Never go outside barefoot. Same for all of these bites and stings. Wear gloves when working in the yard and then scorpion proof your child's crib by moving it away from the wall and placing the legs in glass jars. You can also make your home unwelcoming to scorpions by removing standing water, other water sources, and then food sources like crickets. And lastly, our Gila monster. Very quick here because we see almost no bites from Gila monsters, but they are our favorite creatures. So we have one bite in 2019. Um, they are protected in Arizona. That means it's illegal to harass, harm, or kill a Gila monster. They're very shy, non-aggressive, and slow moving. If you see one, it's a bit of an Arizona treat. So what happens when they bite you? Here is our reptile curator explaining the mechanism of a Gila monster bite. So the venom gland is right here. So you can see it's a little bulbous right there. And like I said, there's four lobes to the venom gland. Each venom gland has its own venom duct that leaks into the mouth. When the animal latches on to, like, let's say a coyote's nose and holds on, that venom will then seep into it through its teeth. Its teeth have grooves on it. It's really cool. So it's called capillary action. We'll pull the venom right into the wound and cause it to be very, very painful. So again, very painful Gila monster bites. They do have grooved teeth, and then the venom comes up through your teeth, and they chew and hold on in order to inject that venom. venom. So the general reaction to Gila monster bite is burning pain and swelling within 15 minutes. People might also be affected by hypotension, so low blood pressure, which causes weakness, faintness, and dizziness. And then other symptoms could be sweating, nausea, vomiting, chills, and fever. But again, extremely painful. Best way to prevent a bite is do not touch a Gila monster. Just leave them alone. Um, if you are bitten, this is a hospital visit, so seek medical attention immediately. But again, we do not see many of these bites. Now, if you are bitten or stung, we want you to call poison control, like in the number on the right. Our specialists will assess the severity of the bite, sting, or poisoning, provide treatment recommendations, refer you to a hospital as needed, and actually tell the hospital you're coming. Monitor the case and then provide additional backup in the form of physician if needed. And we also have a follow-up system for patients in our care. So now that was very quick, but if you have questions, drop them in the chat box and we will answer them now. You can also save my contact information if you'd like to contact me in the future. All right. Well, thank you, Laura. That was 
uh, both informative and very creepy. <laughs> <laughs> so I appreciate that. We do have questions from our audience. Um, first of all, um, are there any statistics on bites and domesticated pets? So folks that, you know, have snakes in their, in their care. Uh, we typically don't see many people bitten. Um, if they actually keep um, rattlesnakes in their house, usually they are very used to handling rattlesnakes and take all the precautions, but we do see quite a few bites in dogs. Um, almost never cats, but dogs do get bitten by rattlesnakes. If a dog is bitten by a rattlesnake, we want them to go to the vet. Usually vets in Arizona have anti-venom on hand and they can provide it at that time. And there are rattlesnake trainings for dogs as well, and we highly recommend that as a way to deter pets from getting in contact with rattlesnakes. Again, yeah. usually just dogs. Yes, I've heard about the trainings. I know that um, it's really important uh, because they are very interested, especially puppies. So um, yes. is, it, is the venom different for dogs than it is for humans, the anti-venom? The anti-venom is usually the same, just in different dosages. Oh, okay. Um, how about cats? Have you had any instances where cats have been bitten? As far as I know, and I can always go back and look at our, our stats, but no, it's, it's pretty much never cats. Now cats might be stung by scorpions, but they usually mm -hmm. don't have serious effects. Right, yeah, they seem to be very interested in scorpions. I know mine is. <laughs> they usually kill the scorpions. Yes, yeah. Um, one of the questions is, what is the best pain reliever to take for a scorpion bite? And how, and how do they impact pets, which is one you already answered. Yeah, so scorpion stings, you can take any pain reliever that works best for you. We recommend either something like Tylenol or ibuprofen if you have it on hand. So just a simple over-the-counter pain medication is fine. Uh, you did a great presentation on what to do with cribs and taking them away from the wall. The listener wants to know why do you put the glass jars on the legs? Yeah, so the reason you put the glass jars, you put the legs of the crib in the glass jar is because scorpions can actually not crawl or climb up a smooth surface. That's why you might find them trapped in the tub or the sink because they can't climb out. So they can't climb smooth surfaces like glass, um, which is why you want to put those legs in glass jars. Interesting. Uh, one of the questions is, are rattlesnakes common at a higher elevations like near Summerhaven? Yes, actually, um, like I was saying before, you can actually find that black-tailed rattlesnake up in Mount Lemmon, typically at higher elevations. And there are a couple other rattlesnakes that also prefer higher elevations, like the Arizona black rattlesnake, which you can mm -hmm. definitely find up near Summerhaven. Great. Uh, they said great presentation and uh, service for Arizona, so thank you. They'd like to know how is the hotline staffed and how is it funded? Yeah, absolutely. So right now, all of our staff that answer the hotline are licensed pharmacists who receive an additional certification as a specialist in poison information. Um, so everyone's a pharmacist that staffs the phone line. And then we do have some physicians on call for backup, as well as health, uh, health educators like me, and then genetic counselors with the Mother's Baby um, Arizona hotline. We typically have about 12 pharmacists and they rotate for the 24 seven coverage. How are we funded? We do receive some federal funding through HRSA, as well as state funding through the Arizona Department of Health Services, and then other contracts and various streams of funding. But it is true that Poison Center funding is very inconsistent and unstable. So we do ask for support as much as possible. Great. Um, one uh, listener said, greetings from Mexico. Um, <laughs> but another wanted to know, are rattlesnakes um, common on golf courses or fairways? Yes, you can definitely find rattlesnakes out on golf courses. And a lot of our patients in Green Valley do report seeing them out on the golf courses. Honestly, you'll find brow snakes pretty much anywhere. Um, a lot of their living habitat is being taken out because of construction. And so seeing brow snakes in our communities is going to become more common. Um, but yes, you'll find them on golf courses, especially if there are pack rat burrows, because brow snakes do like to get into those burrows and stay there. So they can't actually dig on their own, but they do like to sleep and hide inside of those burrows take advantage of the situation. Yeah. Well, Laura, thank you. This was really informative and I think really important for our listeners. So thank you so much. We appreciate your time. And thank I'm you. going to go ahead and move on. All right, thank you. Thank you. So again, thank you to Laura and her information and from the University of Arizona College of Pharmacy. It's nice to know that our pharmacists are doing this um, extra work for us to keep us safe. 
So next week, um, we want to make sure and have you join us. We will have Dr. Taylor Rial uh, joining us. She's a professor and interim chair at the Department of Surgery. And she is going to be talking about mindfulness for stress reduction. So I know that right now we are all under a lot of stress um, with not only the pandemic, but going back to school and um, with the heat. And so uh, we can always use that. So be sure and join us for that. Register and share it with your friends. So on behalf of us at the University of Arizona Health Sciences, be safe, be well, and of course, bear down and mask up. See you next week.